Uh, we've talked a lot about opportunities and challenges today, and uh, I think the panelists are, are guarded optimists, and I think that's, that's a good way to, to frame it. We had, as I think many of you know, uh, we had President Martelli here, uh, I guess about 10 days ago now, and I was particularly impressed with him and his team, and I think that they, are, they understand uh, the challenges of, of, of trying to create, uh, create jobs and also trying to meet some of the social uh, deficits that are in Haiti. And um, I know that uh, President uh, Moreno of the IDB was talking recently about the importance of having 6% growth and that it was possible to have 6% growth in Haiti and that uh, that's what, what needed to happen. Um, so we're going to have three uh, entrepreneurs and, and also folks from the public sector talking about the role of the private sector and private investment in the Haitian economy. You have their uh, biographies in front of you, so I'm not going to go through them, but I'm going to just cede the floor uh, to each of my fellow panelists, and I'll, we'll take it from, from there. We're going to first hear from Brad Horwitz, who um, is the is one of the is the president and CEO of Trilogy International Partners, who's the owner and operator of Walla in Haiti. Many of you who've been to Haiti, of course, are familiar with Walla, the, one of the prominent cell phone companies there. Brad, over to you. Terrific. Yeah. Okay, so what, the, the arrows. Yeah. Is that how this works? Well, terrific. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks, Dan, and and thank you for for being here today. Uh, a quick word about, about who we are, because I'm pretty sure nobody has ever heard of Trilogy. Um, we're, a, we're a private company. Uh, my partners and I um, have really only done one thing in our entire career, and that's we've been involved in the wireless business. With the breakup uh, of AT&T back in, in 1982, we thought that if you could walk around with a phone, we could probably sell a lot of them. Uh, we embarked on the non-wireless side of the business, built up a company to be the largest uh, cell phone company in the world. We sold that business to AT&T uh, in 1994, which subsequently sold to Singular, which subsequently AT&T bought back. Um, it had kind of gotten into our blood, and so we formed a trio of additional companies under the banner of Western Wireless. One was a business focused on servicing rural America uh, in a technology-agnostic manner. One was a company that we thought would be the first to bring the GSM technology into the U.S. That company was called VoiceStream. Uh, and the third was a portfolio of international assets with a particular focus on markets that were out of the mainstream of the bigger players. I ideally, we would say places that you would never want to go uh, on holiday, but we thought that there was an opportunity there. In 2000, we sold VoiceStream to a company which is today T-Mobile, uh, which ironically AT&T is now trying to buy. We, we sold the Western wireless business, domestic business, to a company called Altel, which subsequently sold it to Verizon. We were left with a portfolio of 13 international assets, which we sold off to a myriad of, of players around the world when it came down to the last few orphans, if you will, which were the countries of Haiti and Bolivia. Uh, the line of people uh, looking to invest in those countries was pretty short. Um, and so my partner, uh, John Stanton, his wife and I uh, personally bought back the companies um, from Altel. Uh, that happened in 2006. We're based out of Seattle, Washington. We're a small private company, our own capital, capital from our friends and families. We're licensed today to provide service in four different countries, over 33 million people with a focus purely on, on wireless. When it comes to Haiti, um, we have been there 12 years as an operating company, but actually 14 years um, as a company being there. We didn't start out or plan to be the largest U.S. investor in the country, but, uh, but we are today. Currently, we have over 1.2 million customers, over 540 employees, over 20,000 indirectly uh, Haitians are employed or earn their living through the marketing um, of our products and services a hallmark of our company, and one of the real reasons that my partner and I bought the business back was the unique opportunity that we saw that you could do well in business by doing good. Uh, our our uh, CSR activities have always been a hallmark um, of the company. We've always felt, going back to the early days, that giving back to the communities that, that you serve is a smart thing to do and a good thing to do, and never did we see the opportunity to put that into play than we did in Haiti. We, we were humbled and extremely honored uh, to win the ACE Award uh, from Secretary Clinton. 
which is the award for, for corporate excellence, uh, largely uh, completely due to our work in Haiti. And that we also um, had, in effect, legitimized the Voila Foundation. We, were a found we had it by name before as the vehicle in country that would, that would be the vehicle with which we'd fund these initiatives after the earthquake. After the earthquake, my partner and I uh, decided to make this a legitimate 501c corporation. Uh, my partner funded the company with over a million dollars. We committed over three million dollars in products and services, made a handful of calls to friends and family, and actually turned the foundation into a multi-million dollar foundation that continues to support the various projects and the needs you know, of the country. A little bit about the sector in Haiti, the telecom sector, which has arguably been one of the few robust uh, opportunities in the country. Today there's about 3.75 million wireless subscribers. The business is almost exclusively prepaid, which means it is a cash business. It's also a, a business that is very dependent on the diaspora. Figures somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of the GD, official GDP of the country comes in via the diaspora. For us, however, and for our other our competitors in the country, it's also a significant source of revenues given the international traffic that flows in and comes through us. Not only is this a significant source of our overall revenue, but in a country like Haiti where the currency is not, where there's no forward market and there's certainly no hedging, you know, of the gourd, this in effect serves as a currency hedge for the revenues that we generate. We have found, we believe in Haiti and we believe this everywhere in the world, that any economic development in a frontier or developing market can only occur if there is basic infrastructure in place in the country. There is a market and dramatic increase in the GDP of a country once this is established. We believe that Haiti today is poised with the appropriate amount and an ongoing growing amount of infrastructure being developed to actually see that GDP start to rise. The, the, network, uh, in, the networks themselves in Haiti lend themselves to new economic, new economic opportunities, new technologies that will come into play, such as the mobile money product that we'll, we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, the sector today is one of the largest uh, investment sectors in the country and one of the largest sources of tax revenue there. The sector today creates over 50,000 jobs uh, directly and indirectly. I believe it's the largest private sector employer uh, in the country. Um, I, to put that a little bit in perspective, as I was seeing some of the other um, some of the other presentations when they were talking about jobs and income, and averages are just that, an average. Our average employee in Haiti uh, makes about $850 a month um, overall, which when you think about that rel relative to the minimum wage and everything else, it's a pretty strong, uh, a pretty strong base for the country that's there. Over one and a half billion dollars uh, has been invested in the telecom uh, sector through through this year, and you know, kind of a a, a telling tale and, and a little bit of a scary <laughs> tale when it comes to the government and it comes to revenues between ourselves and our competitor, we contribute about 25 percent of the total tax revenues into the country. This is two companies that is generating this kind of deal, which is both, uh, you know, a little. Uh, it, it takes your breath away a little bit because it sort of magnifies and exemplifies the challenges that the government is going to have in ever attaining, you know, self-sufficiency through what, you know, through historically a tax base. Um, you know, never, never has the role of wireless uh, been more pronounced or more important than, than with what happened, um, you know, at the earthquake, you know, a little over a year ago. I mean, aside from the obvious, you know, abilities for the Haitians to communicate and for messages coming back in. The infrastructure that we had in the country became instrumental for the, for the, for the Army, for the Navy, for the Coast Guard, for everybody that was trying to provide relief services into the country. You know, the, the working network became absolutely a lifeline, you know, for the country. It also created a number of innovative, you know, services and applications that have been helping the aid organizations and the NGOs more efficiently and better direct, you know, their efforts. We worked with the Red Cross to develop an application that could target specifically on a cell site by cell site basis specific messaging to affected 
uh, to the affected population of various areas, whether it was related to cholera as to where the nearest clinics were, whether it's related to a hurricane as to what direction the, sta the, the, stores are, uh, the uh, storms were coming. What this really allowed us to do as the private sector is to very efficiently support uh, the agencies that were working to support the country in a variety of ways. Probably the most important and innovative thing that is coming out of Haiti is the implementation of the mobile wallet solution. The mobile money, it's called M-Pesa in Kenya. It goes by a number of different names around, around the world. But this simple application of technology in the case of Haiti, we believe will be one of the strongest foundations of improving the overall economic environment of the country. For those of you not familiar, it's simply the notion of using your cellular telephone as a wallet to receive money, to transfer money, and to purchase goods and services. I was told by one of the larger NGOs in the country that up to 40 cents on the dollar in distributing cash and, and relief efforts in Haiti goes towards the logistics of moving cash around. This application of this technology absolutely eliminates it. Anybody who's got people working in Haiti that's trying to process payroll or to write checks or to deal with the banking system knows specifically you know, what, how unproductive and how inefficient this is. Today, we are providing payroll services to thousands of employees and to thousands of cash for work programs by utilizing this technology, which is secure, it's safe, it's quick, and because of the applications driven by the cash for work programs and grant programs, we've worked very, very closely in developing this with Mercy Corps. You know, it has taken the learning curve and the training and the trusting element of adoption to this up to a much, to a much quicker grade. And we think this is going to be one of the most significant things to drive efficiencies and to bring banking services back to, you know, a much larger, a much larger part of the communication. Uh, 3G and Internet access, well, you know, you, technology keeps going. It is our belief um, that Haiti is going to be, on a worldwide basis, a country where the predominant method of accessing to the Internet is going to be over mobile devices, whether they're pads, whether they're smartphones, whatever they are. The applications there are going to dramatically accelerate and surpass, we believe, most of the developed world. This requires, however, a doubling down. And so we are embarking this year, as are our competitors, in dramatic and expansive upgrades um, to the network. There's a lot of talk going on about taking access out to the rural areas, particularly challenging in Haiti. That's largely an economic issue, given the cost of building and the, and the affordability of this. We're finding some very creative ways to develop this and deploy this with some of the NGOs, such as Invinio, through collaborating in private-public partnerships to the mutual benefit of everybody. This sector, however, has significant challenges. The, the first couple of points here don't just apply to our sector, but it really applies to everyone there. You know, the, the infrastructure in Haiti, as everybody knows, is, is you know, um, it doesn't work, is in sorely need of, of, of reparation. The ports, the roads, when we have to put a site somewhere, we have to build a road to actually get to it. Those of you who are involved in shipping everything in know what it's like, you know, dealing with the port's power. My entire network in Haiti runs on generators 24 by 7. You know, I will spend $8 million this year buying fuel to keep the power, and ironically, Given the pricing, the government set pricing on power today, that's actually cheaper than buying what scarce fuel, what scarce power is actually available today. The logistics involved with this, the security involved with this, you know, turns a business model generally upside down in how these things are done. In fact, the recent uh, activity in the Middle East, which now has translated into the government, which mandates and controls the price of fuel, that just cost me $2 million this year just based on what that increase in fuel pricing is going to be given what's going on you know around the world security obviously security is an issue fuel is a very desired commodity so every one of these sites that has generators and fuel has to have security you got to have security for the security guys you know because they can be entrepreneurial you know as well Insti you know institutional weakness in our case 
Um, it's, in the, it's in the regulatory environment, you know, that's there. There is not, there's a lack of, of sort of global expertise in how to manage this sector. It's been mismanaged in the past. The, the historical natural resources of a government of a country as it relates to spectrum needs to be appropriately and, and sufficiently allocated. That's always, that's always been a challenge there. There's a, there's a lack of due process, obviously transparency issues, you know, courts. You know, there, as a practical matter, there are no courts. You know, the notion of contract sanctity and all that are, are sort of interesting ideas as it stands today. These challenges, again, go beyond just my sector. Conflicts of interest, well, you know, the government, the previous government, uh, prior to the earthquake, privatized uh, the telephone company, uh, but maintained a significant stake in it. And so you've got this bizarre situation where the government is now a competitor and managing the regulatory body of the telecom sector in Haiti. That's just, that's just like a bad idea on so many levels, <laughs> you know, that, that, needs to be, that needs to be addressed. Uh, taxation, you know, it's, it is a, um, we are a successful company in Haiti. Our competitors are a successful company. Uh, and so we are often and consistently the target uh, of new ways of generating revenue, you know, for the country. If you go back to my earlier bullet point on the slide where we're already producing 25, 28 percent of the tax revenues for the government. It's like, you know, how much, you know, how many times can you squeeze this goose, you know, before, you, you know, you come up empty? Uh, specific obstacles to us relates to technology, relates to, you know, access to the internet. There is no viable undersea cable service that there's today. There is one that's owned by the Bahamians and the government, but commercially it's, it's basically unrealistic and unavailable. Uh, fraud is an enormous issue uh, in Haiti, in my world, in my sector, with telephony, with coming in, with gray routes, gray market. Technology, to a large degree, facilitates that. Anyone with a computer in Haiti and access to the Internet certainly d bypasses, you know, traditional long distance and calling routes. Can't stop technology going in, but the illegal marketing uh, and the lack of enforcement capabilities within the government is one of the things that you know constantly pounds at us as as part of as part of being there. In spite of this, um, we continue to invest uh, in the country. We'll continue uh, to bring new technologies into the business. We'll continue you know to support the new government and do everything that we can to bring additional investment into the country. Everyone who reasonably could have a phone today in Haiti has one. You know, the, the, the thing that nobody sort of really understands, of the almost 4 million customers in Haiti today, half of those customers spend about $1.50 a month. Given the challenges with security, power, and logistics in that country, that network costs about $3 a subscriber a month. And so what that really tells you is that a very small percentage of the population in Haiti is contributing a very disproportionate amount of revenue, and it's also a business, just as the business developed in the U.S., that is being, in effect, subsidized by the international traffic, you know, that's coming in. Beyond, the, uh, uh, beyond this, uh, the fixes that need to happen, I think everyone has been talking about them, but in terms of um, regulation and subsidies that have been in place, I think the new government needs to focus on bringing some of those elements to put some certainty back into the cost structures of the business. You've heard talk about the uh, new industrial park up in the north, uh, a very comprehensive project that we're pretty excited about. We're, we're trying to get it engaged and involved in that. It's a project that also demonstrates the need for dramatic coordination amongst, amongst groups that need to be there. The opportunities, we had a chance to host a group that's looking at an enterprise fund down in Haiti. If you look just at my income statement, at my basic P&L, you can identify dozens of entrepreneurial businesses that can be developed into the country just to support my needs. I can support 22 small businesses just taking care of things that I can't get done today. You magnify that across the different sectors and there's phenomenal opportunities, but basically, Haiti's got to be a friendlier place. There's got to be security in the place. I, I'll never forget listening to uh, former Secretary Colin Powell, who said, cash is a coward. You know, it is only going to go places where it feels safe. And the government needs to make investors and to make money feel safe through 
through um, bilateral investments agreements, by putting a court system back into place, by giving investors some basic confidences that they have a reasonable chance of security you know, for their money. Every challenge that we see in Haiti is fixable today with some sound policy, a solid game plan, private sector participation in this, and a government that is beholden only to the people of Haiti. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Michael Ronan uh, is the Vice President for Government Re Relations and Community Affairs at, uh, at Community Relations at Royal Caribbean. Royal Caribbean has been an investor in Haiti for over 25 years and is the owner of the Labadee uh, Private Port and uh, is going to tell us about the tourism sector. If you'll excuse me, I'll, uh, I'll stay here at the table. Unfortunately, I arrived here. My computer did, but my program didn't. So I'm going to try to piece it together here from uh, a couple of emails, if you don't mind. Uh, First of all, uh, our thanks to CSIS for allowing us to participate in the panel today. It's an honor to be here. It's been an honor to be in Haiti for over 25 years. Uh, in talking with some of our associates here, um, it's really pretty amazing when we think back about how many things have happened in those last 25 years. But unfortunately, it almost se seems to be a cycle where you just about get ready to implement change and something else happens. And unfortunately, you get set back again to the starting point and sometimes worse, obviously, in the case of the earthquake now. But I think the word today again was resilience. The people of Haiti amazingly have not only survived the 25, they've survived uh, over 200 years of cycles in their life, and uh, they're still resilient. So I think they're the best example of what we, we, we should look to uh, um, as we look forward. Uh, uh, just with a kind of a raise of hands, how many people have ever been on one of our ships visiting Labadee, Haiti? Oh, that's actually interesting, but scary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I definitely had, should have brought some brochures with me, but that, that's okay. We'll get, we'll get to that. Well, uh, again, then I'll, I'll say a little bit more about it than I might have otherwise. Um, Haiti evolved out of a concept back in the 1980s where cruise ship companies, including Royal Caribbean Corporation, uh, looked to purchase and or lease islands or sites uh, in countries around the Caribbean where we could bring cruise ship visitors, create a, a, an environment, in some cases purely beach, like in the Bahamas, in others, cultural and beach and other environments if we could, depending on the country. Uh, and uh, these developed actually starting in the 1970s and then into the 1980s and 90s, and they continued to develop. Um, we entered into an agreement uh, with the country of Haiti in 1986 it was a 50-year lease on the peninsula and the terrain around it. It's about 260 acres of land, of which we have to date developed about 100 acres of that land. Uh, it's a beautiful site for those of you that have not seen it. Uh, it's a bay with the peninsula, and the bay uh, has beaches on both the ocean side and on the bay side. You have the Labadee Village is the closest population. Cape Haitian is about seven miles to the east. Um, not very accessible by road. Uh, so effectively, it, it's been a plus and minus. It's, a, it's an area we have been able to develop almost independently of the other country when that's been the way to do it, and we've had to survive some of the ups and downs of the government. Uh, it's made it very difficult when we wanted to grow and incorporate ourselves more into the society for those same lack of, of infrastructure facilities. So as I say, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, it is um, operated by a corporation called Solano, a Haitian corporation of which Royal Caribbean uh, is the sole uh, owner. And uh, we have a team on the ground there. The president of Solano is Maurice Kadar, uh, who has been with us for many years. Maurice was previously Minister of Tourism for Haiti. Uh, I forget the exact period, and I apologize. It was, I think, about 15 years ago. Um, and what it is, it's a location where we have been able to develop uh, a site where the cruise ship arrives for a day. We not only provide a beach experience, but over the years we've been able to add other elements to it, taking advantage of the elevations and the beauty of the site to include everything from uh, zip lines, as they're called today, where you, you jump on a, uh, or climb a tower or are taken to an elevation and you're strapped into a harness. We literally have uh, a five line zip line that you actually go from the edge of the bay over the water, over the ocean, and end up on the beach on the opposite side. 
uh, we have something called a dragon coaster, which is a dry roller coaster, which comes down the, the side of the mountain. These are things that were a very adventure-driven company, very innovative, and we found ways to integrate these into the property. But I think the important thing is, what does this really mean uh, for um, our relationship with the country and what we've been able to to do to benefit the country of Haiti, not only our visitors to the country. Uh, what it means today is we permanently employ 260 uh, local employees. This includes security staff, food and beverage staff, um, waiters on the, on the beach, uh, all, all forms of, of um, different professions in that area. These can lead to jobs on board our cruise ships if the staff show themselves qualified over time because we see their customer uh, relation skills and their ability to deal with our guests reach a point where we can move them on board our vessel if they choose to. Some of them have been with us for those 25 years uh, on board the ships and continue to become professionals on board our vessels in significantly higher capacities on board. Uh, we basically are self-contained. We run 24-7 generators and water recycling process. And we basically do have housing for 50 people on the site, which includes security and a limited number of expats. Um, mostly in the supervisory capacities and technical areas to maintain the physical plant and the management part of the process. Even though we have brought management up through the ranks on the Haitian side and, and will continue to do so as we move forward. Uh, the site also very importantly includes uh, significant areas for um, arts and crafts shopping. And I'll lead into this in another element as far as where it's going in the future. Uh, we presently have areas for 200 vendors at a time there's a pool of 600 uh, handicraft vendors that have been certified by Royal Caribbean, and we rotate them through the site uh, 200 at a time um, on, on a regular rotation basis. Uh, we also in, employ approximately 40 people that are operating um, local shore excursions. These are people, entrepreneurs, that have purchased snorkeling boats or built sailboats or brought them in. They have been able, we've supported them financially so that they can assure that the quality is to international standards. And then they take over and completely wholly own those operations. And we basically pre-sell those products. And then the guests go on those excursions when they get to Labadee. Uh, and that again, the revenue stream is totally in the hands then of the, of the local entrepreneur. We also have six troops of uh, troubadours, local musicians and performing young lady, uh, men and women uh, who are part of our entertainment program. Uh, every time that we have a vessel arriving in, in Labadee. As far as our overall investment in the site, uh, over the 25-year um, term to date, we have invested uh, approximately $55 million. And uh, the largest portion of that was in 2008-9. We agreed with the Haitian government that to be able to receive our largest cruise ships, which are the Oasis and Allure class that carry 6,000 passengers per voyage. We needed to start docking the ships in Labadee as opposed to bringing them off in smaller landing craft or tenders as they are called, which is what we had done traditionally. So we made a $22 million investment in the pier. Um, an additional $20 million was invested on land to improve the site for the larger volume of pastors, including food and beverage facilities, the shopping areas and other areas of support. Uh, and the interesting part about that is that the result of that is that we also entered into one of the first private public partnerships with the Haitian government in which they basically become 81% owner of that docking facility over time and Royal Caribbean retaining 19% of that ownership. Uh, we did, as a part of the agreement, uh, extend um, with two extensions on our present agreement, which all going well will take us out to the year 2050. Uh, as far as uh, our leaseholding in, in Labadee. The, uh, the other part of it, and then I'll get into the future, and I'll, I'm trying to move this as expeditiously as I can. Basically, a very important part of our activities in Haiti have always been the CSR activities well before the hurricane. Hurricanes and the earthquake, of course. We have uh, had a Solano Foundation uh, since the corporation was formed. Uh, and through that, we have been able to direct uh, both recyclable goods, uh, and what I mean by that is not the plastics and glass, but our ships are constantly being renovated, and in so doing, many times we are um, taking very, very usable materials, everything from computers to tables and chairs and furniture and beds out of our ships, medical supplies, um, and we then recycle those, make sure they're in good condition, and then channel those into institutions in Haiti where can they, they can be made of good use 
whether it's in medical clinics, schools, hospitals, or whatever the case may be in, in Haiti, mostly again to date on the northern coast. Um, during the, we've also had a special project with uh, USAID and Focal and invested $350,000 constructing a water system to deliver clean water into Labadee Village, which is right across the bay from the actual facility that we operate. Um, when the, hurric the uh, earthquake took place, uh, clearly for all of us, it was, it was a huge shock, uh, no pun intended, of course. Um, but a couple of things happened. We corporately knew immediately that the role we could best play was to continue to call it Haiti with our cruise ships and not pull out of Haiti and effectively pull out the only real active revenue generating activities in the country at a time when they most needed it. We took the criticism for it. We were blasted pretty hard at first in the press and some pictures came up with obviously people laying on a beach and 100 miles away were devastated buildings. Those are the facts. We couldn't change those. But I think over a very short period of time, fortunately, people came around and realized it was the right thing to do. We were supported from the very beginning by the, the, um, the Clinton Foundation. Uh, they came down and visited the site, and we all realized that by continuing to bring revenue into the country, revenue which is uh, pumped into the economy, keep people employed, we brought economic activity to the northern coast, which was almost completely forgotten about initially because logically the attention was on the south coast where it was needed. We also were able to use our vessels to bring in supplies. We opened our vessels up to shipping of pallets of merchandise to the global community. And with PADF, with uh, um, Food for the Poor and others, we were able to, on every one of our vessels, bring in as many as 200 to 300 pallets of supplies uh, into Labadee and then coordinate their transfer to the needed locations around the island or around the country. So again, we believe at that time it worked out uh, some difficult moments, but it went very well. Uh, and we were able to also, through our medical team, work very closely with the hospital in Milo that ended up receiving a lot of people coming up from Port-au-Prince looking for medical aid. And we were able to support them substantially in being able to respond to those needs. Um, where are we now, right now in, in simple terms, Royal Caribbean uh, pays a per person fee to get to some of the financials to the Haitian government in the form of a $10 per person tax. That represents approximately $6 million a year in direct tax that goes directly to government uh, in that fee. We also basically pay in wages and other services approximately $9 million a year. Uh, that's including salaries, uh, purchase of fuel, supplies, and other things for the operation of the Labadee site. Our projections are that we will continue to bring somewhere in the neighborhood of 550 to 600,000 visitors per year uh, over the foreseeable future. Um, it is, we are limited right now. We choose not to take more than one ship uh, per day into Labadee, but it can handle two ships a day. So we'll see what, what the future brings. We are also in discussions with government to see if we will open it up to other cruise lines using it, if there should be a demand. And that's all part of our agreement with them regarding the, the build out of the facility to its larger capacity. Um, where are we going in the future? Um, we have already been participating with IDB in some of the preliminary work on the Citadel project. Um, we uh, believe in it. Our CEO has made some comments about that. Personally, I can only add that I had the honor and privilege, um, a little bit unbelievably sometimes, to actually take tourists off of cruise ships to Labadee 40 years ago. Uh, every week, we had two cruise ships visited Cape Haitian, and on a very routine and very well-operated basis, we took tourists up to Milo and up to the Citadel, and they thoroughly enjoyed their visit. Obviously, all of that went away, uh, but I think for personal reasons, I, I know what can happen. And uh, we know there's a lot to be done right now politically to see the structure that's going to come out to support it with the DMO. But uh, Royal Caribbean stands ready, apart from what we've already done, to, to see what, what we can do to support that initiative. In the short term, I think it would be extremely important to use our critical mass in some of the small and medium uh, size enterprises we've talked about. Uh, we have all of this craft vending on the site. Clearly, there's a huge opportunity there if we can link with the right industries to create some new art some valued art and, and work and crafts in Haiti, uh, not the repetitive materials that we may be seeing today that are coming out of the, out of the enterprises, and really be able to project that to a global market. Uh, our guests are very international, 
And uh, believe me, anything that we can sell there and, and really uh, raise the level of recognition and pride over those articles will have an international projection immediately. Uh, we are obviously marketed all over the world uh, as the global company that we are. And uh, for us, it would be just one other way that we would be able to support what has been a very longstanding and good relationship with the country of Haiti. Uh, and having said that, I'm just going to kind of wrap up with that. Um, just one last comment. Um, I, I did overlook, and I apologize. Uh, we raised about five, uh, five million dollars between um, donations and corporate uh, matching for Haiti right after the earthquake. One of those, um, um, one of the projects, our chairman said that he definitely wanted is he wanted to make sure we got involved in education. Um, we tried to partner with a number of institutions to get a school open by October. Uh, as we all know, that's frustrating to do, thing, do things on a short agenda, uh, short schedule. Um, Richard's a bit impatient, uh, our chairman, so he basically said, just get it done. Uh, the school opened on October 23rd. Uh, we are presently housing 200 students at the complex just outside of Labadee Village, uh, and we're very happy that we were able to put the school into place. Uh, we still stand ready to work with other uh, NGOs and private companies. We believe we've got a model around the way that school has been built and structured. Uh, we'd be happy to share that model and see if we can maybe reach out and build some other schools like it in other parts of Haiti. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity of being here, and we'll look forward to the opportunity if we have a Q&A session. Thank you. I, I would only add that when you go to Labadee, subtly disguised as a palm tree, is a cell site <laughs> providing cellular service <laughs> to all of your passengers. I'm going to cede the floor now to Augustine Aguirre, who's the uh, country manager for the Haiti uh, Crisis Response Team at the Inter-American Development Bank. IDB has been the lead agency on the Haiti response, so I think we're going to uh, be very interested to hear Augustine's uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And this final session was supposed to be actually three big global corporations working in Haiti, Trilogy Voila, Royal Caribbean, and SEA. SEA is a, a Korean leading garment firm, um, soon to be the uh, uh, anchor tenant of the industrial park in the north. Um, so I'm, and Chairman Kim uh, uh, couldn't come, so I was called in the last minute to, to make a presentation. As you can see, I'm not Chairman Kim, so I'll try to <laughs> I try to present the the industrial park project from the uh, uh, providers of the infrastructure perspective. And Chairman Kim, in a next opportunity, will surely talk about the, the the garment business itself. I wanted to talk about the development program in the north in a more broad perspective, rather than focusing exclusively in in the industrial park. Maybe due to the lack of time, I, I, I should focus more on, on the industrial park. But one of the objectives of the government is to promote decentralization. That's part of their constitution. That's part of their uh, obvious needs. Uh, um, and soon after the earthquake, it soon became obvious that the best thing to do uh, um, to invest in Port-au-Prince was to invest outside of Port-au-Prince. And that's also a need in, in economic terms right now, and that's one of the governments, the new government, uh, objectives. The northern region is also one of the poorest in the country, which is a lot to say. And um, there are sound business opportunities there for many reasons, logistical reasons, manpower reasons, uh, the Dominican border is closed, the land titling is not as dramatic issue as there as it's in, uh, in other places. So let me talk about what this northern development uh, uh, program looks like. And there are three big opportunities. There are three big sectors which are prioritized, agriculture, tourism, and industry, especially the garment industry. The whole of this program uh, adds up to about $1.1 billion in investment. About 45, a little bit more than 45% of that is already secured by funds committed by the bank, by the government of the US, by Spain, by the European Union, the other is, is the, the rest is private, and the rest is yet to be obtained. But there's a big donor coordination between all of the actors, and uh, coordination has become a sort of a, a hollow concept. And, and there's integration. I think that, that we're all working under a single program, providing funds to a single program. And the work we are doing together with the government of the US is just uh, amazing and a big learning experience. 
And the government of, the, of, of Haiti, in many of its institutions, is deeply involved there. What's this $1.1 billion, uh, uh, $1 .1 billion investment? 125 of those are the public side, the public investment for private sector development, and Julie Katzman uh, spoke, spoke throughout the, the, during lunch about this uh, uh, social investment fund and a different window, so I won't get into, into there. But that, that we think that uh, leads to the creation or revitalization of the middle class, I think one of the biggest uh, uh, challenges in Haiti today. The rest, infrastructure, and we, we've divided infrastructure into the um, general uh, um, transversal uh, infrastructure covering most sectors. The basic infrastructure like uh, housing, ports, uh, roads, power. And then we have the specific infrastructure for the specific sectors, the irrigation for the uh, agriculture, the heritage revitalization for the tourist, and the industrial park, for example, for the garment industry. So let me get into... Sorry, that's the north part of the country, very close to the U.S. With a legal framework, the Hope Help uh, legislation, which makes it amazingly convenient for many products, specifically the garment products, to get into the U.S. with a speci special uh, tax benefit. There is overabundant uh, labor at cheap cost and um, social corporate responsibility, and many of these companies are looking at uh, Haiti for that purpose, and hopefully most of them are looking at Haiti for business perspective and, 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 and benefits. That's uh, the more specific area which we are looking at. It's east of Cap Haitien, a place called uh, close to Caracol and the Bay of Caracol, beautiful place, by the way. And if you look at the more specific uh, uh, map, that's what the park will look like, and that's where we are working in right now. Basically, three big partners are uh, working together on this. The IDB is dealing with all of the infrastructure inside the park from the fences in, and I'll talk about that in a while. The government of the U.S. is providing power and housing. We are expecting about 40,000 jobs to be created. That's about 200,000 people going to be living there around. And the European Commission will be providing funds for the transport and the logistics, including the road from there via Caracol to Capaicien and improvements in a second stage for the port of uh, Capaicien. All this site is 250 uh, hectares, 40 minutes away from Capaicien, where you have the port and the airport. There has been a big effort of uh, uh, promoting this uh, uh, investment and opportunity. It's a big effort that has led to much more demand than the uh, uh, available funds can today uh, satisfy. So uh, it's already a success, and so a success and an opportunity as uh, there has been little in Haiti for the past years, and the government is working a lot there. It's very complicated. Trying to build, and I've been working on this for the past six or eight months, trying to build this in Haiti with the institutional problems in Haiti, but with so many people looking at Haiti and different NGOs and different uh, interest groups and pressure groups, it's tough. There are a number of studies that have been done. There are a number of studies that have been going on, that are going on right now. And today, the first uh, uh, RFPs are being published. So hopefully in one month, today, th th that's happening as we speak. Hopefully, in one and a half months, we'll be receiving the offers for the building of the uh, uh, basic infrastructure plus the initial 
uh, warehouses in about half of the park. This is not only SEA, uh, uh, this is SEA and three other companies that are signing contracts with the government of Haiti uh, right now. But this will mean about 800,000 square meters of covered building space. This will mean 25 megawatts of energy that need to be provided and will be consumed. 90% of the workers will be uh, Haitian workers. 5% will be supervisors and managers of Haitian origin. The other 5% will probably be foreigners. And uh, this will be generating an increase of around 5% of the GDP in Haiti. This will also mean around $27 million in tax collection. Uh, hopefully one of the big three. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Well, there's one of the of the of the lines in the in the MOUs that have been signed with these different contracts, with the different companies that relates to uh, uh, international labor, environmental, and social standards to be observed. So there's big expectation everywhere. There's big expectation in the bank, and we hope. And the the the, the commitment is that by March of 2012, next year the first warehouses will be in place and the first two companies will be starting to work and to generate the jobs. So we are extremely optimistic about Haiti in general, optimistic about this challenging project in particular, proud to have been a part of it, and uh, still lots of work to be done. So thank you very much, and uh, hopefully next time we come here, we will be showing photographs instead of drawings and people working instead of promises. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask, I'm going to collect three questions because I think our time is short and you've been extraordinarily patient. I'm going to give the first question to the gentleman in the front row. Uh, I know we have some microphones up here. If they could, if there's a gentleman up here in the, the front row that I'd like to hear from first. And then uh, I know there's a woman in the back. And if I can get a third one and we'll group them together. Okay, and the gentleman there. Okay, so, so we're going to start here. Just a comment. In yeah, if, you would, if you'd introduce yourself, each, if everyone could each introduce themselves. My name is Kesno Fayol. I'm an economist, Haitian economist. In fact, by starting, you said that Haiti got to grow by 6% GDP. And we think it's, it's too low. Because for the last 50 years, we got like, negative growth, economic growth in the country. And on the demographic front, we're growing by more than 2%. So we should go to more than 10% growth in Haiti to be able to catch up. And as the government put it, uh, the United Nations in 2010, March 2010, after the earthquake, they want to have an emerging country. That means $50 billion of GDP and uh, more than $55,000 GDP per capita, so it'd be very important. But let's get some numbers to be quick. We got 60,000 jobs in the public sector. And Mr. Martelli came here in this building saying he wants to create jobs. He won't be able to do it at the public sector. So he has no choice. And this morning we were talking about how to change the trend from assistance Keep to- Keep it brief, please. Sure to private investment. And I think Brad and, Ro and Michael has just said it, the transaction costs are too high in Haiti. So if you can decrease the transaction costs, that's the best way to create jobs. And I will finish by just saying on the last competitiveness report that they made on Haiti, that's the sectors tourism, agriculture, construction, ICTs, manufacture, garment. And if you get the platform electricity and telecoms, you can get more than one billion, jo billion million jobs doing so by having less transaction costs that by the government to create the environment, the business environment for that. That's my comment on what you've been saying. Th thank you. The, the lady in the back, please. Henry Gabriel with Haiti Green Project. Uh, with the cost, uh, the rising cost of fuel, I am wondering if you gentlemen are not thinking of using solar energy or wind energy 
to uh, offset the cost. Even in the case of Walla, with uh, their cell tower, if they're thinking of uh, using solar uh, energy or wind energy. And, uh, and also, I've listened to all the presentation uh, during the day, and I'm kind of sad of not hearing anybody uh, tackling the public transportation uh, issue in Haiti. Because we have, uh, we're talking about decentralization and uh, building better, but we're not talking about uh, how we're going to help people living in the outskirts of the major cities to go to work and get home. If we cannot attract a certain investment in the public transportation, uh, however we want to do it, even by uh, having a railroad or buses, uh, the people are just going to go back living closer to uh, the wherever they can work. So even if we move uh, the businesses into the northern side, we don't create the same kind of issues that we have in Port-au-Prince in Cape Haitian or uh, any other cities. Thank you very much. The third, third comment or question, if you'd identify yourself too. Thanks. Daniel O'Neill from the Pan American Development Foundation. My question was about the development up in the north. We're all very excited about this coming in. It's clearly a sign of the new Haiti. I wondered if it also includes upgrades to the other infrastructure, like the airport, if there will be sewage facilities. How much more do we get out of this beyond just the, 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 um, the factories? Thank you. So why don't I, uh, maybe each of you might want to take a piece of any of those questions. How about, uh, Brad, I know you had, uh, you had a view on the, the solar and wind. Would you just? Sure. Um, the great question. Um, Haiti clearly is a place where wind uh, uh, is prevalent. Couple, couple of issues. We have, we have experimented with both. We have actually built two towers today that, to test the wind turbine to see if it actually generates enough power to run the site. It does. I mean, they're, they're clearly if in, in certain parts of the country where there's consistent wind, you can generate enough to do that. The challenge comes in building things to withstand the elements in Haiti. We build, and we have to build, and it's what helped us dramatically during the earthquake, we have to build our infrastructure to manage and face 120 mile an hour wind. And so when all of a sudden you take the cost of building a supplemental tower to run a turbine to power the site, the economics, you know, really as expensive as it is to continue using gensets and power, it wins out. On solar, the challenge of solar, which there's clearly plenty of sunlight in Haiti, the footprint of the panel that's required to generate enough solar energy to then run a site, again, leads to having to build additional infrastructure to support that panel. And so at the end of the day, with the challenges of, of land ownership, of the cost of construction, you know, continuing to use diesel still pans out. What we've been experimenting with are various new technologies and battery technologies that sort of turn off and on to minimize the amount of power and to recycle batteries more effectively. Would you, while, I, while you have the floor, any other comments on the other comments from the, uh, from the floor, either about the business enabling environment or about the infrastructure in the north? Well, in the north, I, I mean, the north is, a, is an unbelievable opportunity. If you take the numbers that they're talking about just in terms, uh, and I believe uh, of the numbers, you know, 5% are going to be sort of brought in from the, from the tenants, another 5% are going to be supervisors. You take that against 4,000 people. I, I was in Cape Haitian about a month ago and I sort of did a, a quick count. There's 109, and I'll use the term loosely, hotel rooms in Cape Haitian. The opportunity for someone to build housing, <laughs> to build housing just to support the workers that are going to be coming in, whether it's bed and breakfasts, whether it's hotels, you know, are, are staggering opportunities for anyone entrepreneurial that aren't large-scale projects that will do it. We are planning on putting a store um, out at that industrial park to service just the demands of the workers. Our banking partner in the mobile wallet is, has committed to open a branch. And all of these things are going to spur additional, additional entrepreneurial opportunities, which will create more jobs and put in needed infrastructure. Thanks. Michael. Okay. Uh, real quickly, on the um, energy, we're a bit different, obviously, because the, the physical plant of the ship is self-sustainable. 
But what we do, uh, we are doing is we are driving the technology in our ships um, all over the world, environmentally, processing, energy cons conservation, any technology that we can take ashore, at least in the immediate Labadee area, we're obviously doing. Some is practical, some is not. I mean, we use solar energy on our ships. Some of it works for small applications in Labadee, but I think uh, we are very technologically driven. We're very environmentally driven. So those two combine very well, and we're really doing everything we can to try to, to use that technology ashore where we can. Uh, regarding the North Coast project, I'm very happy to see it. Obviously, looking at the tourism side of it, as I said, um, we see some tremendous opportunity on the North Coast. It existed there before, even um, just as recently as a couple of years ago, there used to be large volumes of tourists that came across from the Dominican Republic to Cape Haitian, went up and visited the Citadel, filled what were more hotel rooms then than there are today, because you had the Montjoly, you had the Comier Plage, you had other hotels. Um, so we know that under the right circumstances, apart from the development, which will obviously bring in this larger volume of people, under the right master plan, the development of the tourism product on the North Coast has some tremendous potential not just to bring people directly into Haiti, but to bring people in from the Dominican Republic where you're already getting over 3 million visitors a year, plus the cruise ship side that we could augment from. So we see there's a role that tourism can play uh, in a structured master plan program to really look at all the attributes and begin to build in the infrastructure to support it. Thanks. Augustine. Briefly, regarding the first question, energy and solar, solar panels. We look at this from the public side and, and, and the public policy side. Energy in Haiti is a major challenge. Challenge is a major complication. And it stems from, I would say, three different pillars. First, the need for additional generation capacity, which is the easy part of the equation. You need to invest, invest wisely. Solar panels might be one of the, of the solutions. Then you have another huge problem in the public utility, the way EDH is running, the, 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 the regulation of the sector, big problem. Then the third one is the, I would say, the general culture of non-payment. Uh, EDH produces very little energy for a few hours a day for only a small percentage of the population, and still they only get under 30% of the energy. They recover the cost for only 30% of the energy they put into the net. Unsustainable. Okay, so, so, so every addition, and, and this generates a deficit of around 180, 150 million dollars a year, which is generously covered by the governments of the US and of Venezuela. So every additional mega you put into the network is additional million dollars that come into the deficit. So until you solve probably the third of the pillars, you won't be able to solve the second one. And until you solve the second one, every additional mega is a problem. The three of these issues are being covered. The government, the present government of Haiti has uh, uh, initiated under the CIMEP, which is a com commission for the modernization of the state, which successfully uh, um, modernized the telecommunications sector is beginning a new process with EDH and the energy sector, which we are a part of, the government of the US and the World Bank are a part of. Hopefully this will lead to changes there. Going to the second question, and sorry, I, 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 I took a little bit of time there. Yes, the, the, the Northern Development Project should be an opportunity not only for the industrial park or for the tenants of the industrial park, it's an opportunity to develop infrastructure in general and to take their services in general. And there are investments expected in every single subsector. The power generation, the government of the U.S. is planning in, it's planning, no, it's starting to, to build and it's uh, hiring generation of 35 megawatt facility. They got uh, um, an agreement uh, with the government and as an exception for that program, that energy can be sold directly to the users, industrial or individual, and not via EDH. That's not the way usually things are run in, in Haiti. So that's one. You have roads. The, government, the, the, the European Union uh, is putting a lot of money into developing 
the road infrastructure in the north, and they will be investing in the port of Capaicien as well. The government of the Venezuela is rehabilitating the airport in Capaicien, and that's a major uh, program. We will be working in housing in a few of the smaller towns in the north and in um, water and sanitation programs from Wanamanth to the west. So there are a number of uh, uh, infrastructure investments that will benefit not only the small industrial park, but the rest of that. I think we're going to have to end it here. You've been a very patient audience. Please help me in thanking the panel.